Hello, everybody. This week is Parshas Yisro. Parshas Yisro is the Aseras Dibros. We get the Torah by Matan Torah um, on Har Sinai. This is the week. Very exciting. Go listen at Shul. Um, it's a special thing to hear the Aseras Dibros, not only on Shavuos, but on Parshas Yisro, wherever you are. And uh, I'm going to focus on this incredible thing that happened at Har Sinai that we get a description of in the Torah. But before I do, let me ask you something. What feels more real to you? The world, as in the world around you, your life and its challenges that come that come with that? Um, or Hashem, godliness. Elokus is how we say godliness. Uh, elokus, godliness, spirituality, what feels more real to you? Most of us human beings will say the former, right? We, we, it feels the, the existence of the world and our life feels very real. And Hashem, godliness, spirituality, things, you know, it's, it's kind of abstract, you know, you have to really work hard to, to think about it and to, uh, incorporate it into your life and to even believe it. It's it's abstract. It's not in our faces, the way that the world and our life and uh, everything around us is. So that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. However, in contrast to our experience, what if I asked you, okay, what is more real? I asked you before, what feels more real? What about the truth? As in, what is real? What is truth? What is the existence and the reality, uh, the truest reality, the truest existence? Is it the world and our life and everything around us? Or is the true existence, the true reality, Hashem, godliness, uh, spirituality, that all these things that are abstract and intangible? And again, it doesn't feel real to us, but if we think about it, um, what's the true existence, the true reality? And then how come there is this incredible, um, you know, gap between what we know of to be the true reality and true existence and our experience? So by Matan Torah, uh, we have this description from the Torah, the Chol Ha'am, and all of the nation, the whole nation, all the people, Ro'im, they saw, Lerot to see, Ro'im, S. Hakolos. They saw the, what's kolos? Kolos is thunder. Like kol is a voice, right? It's sound. Thunder is kolos. Ve'es halapidim and the flames. Ve'es kol hashofar and the sound of the shofar. Ve'es hahar and the mountain ashain uh, was, was smoking. Vayar ha'am and the nation saw. Vayanu and they shuddered. Vayamdu mirachok and they stood at a distance. So this is you know, describing the incredible, awesome experience of the Jewish people standing by Har Sinai and what they saw. But if you were listening closely, you'll have a question that a, a five-year-old could ask, right? A very simple question. Ro'im? Es hakolos? I taught this uh, idea to my high school class and I had, I happened to have my a uh, toddler, my two, almost three-year-old there. And I was holding him. He wasn't feeling well, so I was holding him. And I said, I said, sweetie, do you see thunder or do you hear thunder? And he said, I hear, we hear thunder. I said, do you see, do you, do you hear thunder with your ears or with your eyes? And he said, with, with my ears. Okay, what about lightning? Lightning I see, I could see with my eyes, right? This is something a two-year-old knows, very clear. So how come the Torah is telling us that by Matan Torah, by the giving of the Torah, they saw thunder. They saw that which is normally heard. What does that mean? And of course, what does it teach us? Because it always has to have something uh, to teach us or it's not Torah. Torah is milashon hora'a from the language of lesson. There's got to be a lesson, something to learn from it. But more, more poignantly, why would God even do that? We know that God does not make miracles for nothing. It's like a rule that he put into the world when he made the world. Um, I heard somebody recently say, 
he didn't he didn't uh create the laws of nature just to you know so easily disregard them there's got to be a really good reason to disregard the laws of nature <laughs> you know he put them in place to to be as they are so we don't we don't have miracles for no reason so what is this miracle this this phenomenon of the jewish people seeing the thunder and rashi adds to this uh rashi adds that rabbi akiva taught that it wasn't just that they saw the thunder but that they heard the lightning. So Ro'in es ha-nishma, they saw that, what does he say in his words? Ro'in es ha-nishma, they saw that which is usually heard, that which is heard. Vishom'in, and they heard es ha that which is usually seen. So they saw what is heard, and they heard what is seen. That is what Rabbi Akiva teaches us. And so we have to ask, what was the purpose of Hashem doing this very unusual act of reversing their senses? What was the purpose of this? Very simply, we have to um, examine what it means to see something versus what it means to hear something. And by doing that, we'll, we'll get back to our answer. So we know that seeing and hearing are very simply two of the five senses, right? They are how we input things from the external world into our system, into our, our knowledge, really. Um, so they're the way that a person receives knowledge from his surroundings, right? AKA sensory input. That's what they are. Very, very simple stuff over here. So a person can know what is around him by, he can know something by seeing it, or he can know something from hearing about it from somebody. But as obvious, and as we will see, these are very, very, very different experiences. We all know the phrase, seeing is believing. There is a fundamental, essential difference between seeing something with your own eyes and hearing about it. In fact, just tonight, I was telling my daughter a story um, and a story of the, the Rebetzin of Lubavitch, Rebetzin Chayimushka, whose yurt it was today. And I was telling her a story and I'm not very good at remembering stories. And I remembered the story a certain way, but it's a very like unbelievable story. So much so that my five-year-old was like, like what? And so she asked me, she asked me, Ma mommy, were you there? Did you see that? Like she couldn't believe it unless I actually saw it with my eyes. And of course, if I saw it, she would believe me. But just hearing it was 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 doubtful to her. And that really is the difference between seeing and hearing. And turns out after bedtime, I went and I looked it up. And I actually got the story wrong. So that just proves our point even more that when you hear something, it's it's secondhand and it, it needs some real good verification process because, you know, they may have exaggerated or may, they may have just misremembered, like I misremembered the story or, you know, it goes from person to person and every time it changes a little bit, that's very different from seeing something with your own eyes. So the thing about Ri'ia, which is sight, seeing, it's the thing is verified in and of itself. When you see it, you believe it, it's clear, it's decidedly obvious to you when you see something for yourself. It, you don't need any proofs. You don't need any explanations if you saw something with your own eyes. Um, he, a, per, a person that sees something is so convinced about the truth of what they saw that there's there's no convincing them, even if it makes no sense. And you're like, I can't believe you. It doesn't make sense that that's what you saw. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I saw it. I can't, you know, my eyes aren't, am I, I'm not hallucinating. You know, what are you telling me? I'm crazy. I saw it with my own eyes. Now, actually, I tried looking it up, but it, I kept thinking of all these different expressions that we use in English to express this idea. There are so many ways that we express this idea. I thought of a good one tonight and then I forgot it. But there, there are so many ways we, in English, we use sight 
to to mean that it it is what it is, right? You'd have to have seen it, right? Like I know you're not gonna believe me, but like you'd have to have seen it. Um, we say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? You can talk and talk and talk and tell me all you want, right? That's like hearing, reading it is like you know hearing it from somebody. But if I see a picture, oh, now now I believe it, right? Now with AI generating pictures, I'm not sure how true that is anymore. But uh, that's besides the point. So English is very clear about this, and you'll you'll start to hear these expressions, and you'll you'll notice them. Oh yeah, that that's another one, um, in which we recognize that seeing is believing. In contrast to shmia, which is hearing, right? hearing hearing something from somebody does not have the same intensity the same strength that seeing does and when you hear something there is always an element of doubt and uncertainty and hesitation like my daughter like what no I, I can't believe, like I can't believe that just because you told it to me <laughs> and um and that is um, that is seeing versus hearing. Hearing is always going to be an element of doubt. Um, however, there is one catch about sight, about seeing something with our eyes. So according to what we've explained, it would seem that really seeing is the greatest. If you're going to rate them, you know, seeing is great because it's obvious, it's clear, it's, it's true in front of your eyes. It seems so true and obvious. And hearing, it's like there's an element of doubt. Do you really know? Did it happen? Um, you know, it could get a little muddled. However, seeing, by definition, is also limited. Because you only can see physicality. And physical, it's limited. Seeing is limited to the physicality, to physicality. And physicality is something that's limited of its own. So if you're looking at something, all you see is the physical existence in front of you, the 3D um, picture before you, but you're missing layers upon layers upon layers of what it really is. And what, you know, even just, Think on a basic science level of like the 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 chemical makeup of it, the the chemistry, the the atoms. The now you might say, okay, but you take a microscope and then you could see it for yourself. Yeah, of course there are levels, right? So for me, looking at something, I'm not seeing all that. I'm just hearing about it in chemistry class, um, or in in um, yeah, um, subjects that discuss these things in science class, and therefore I. I, for me, it's like, I have to take your word on it. Obviously for a scientist, they look at something and they practically can see its makeup. They know it so clearly, they've studied it their whole lives. It's obvious to them that they're not only looking at something on the surface level of what you see, but they see much more depth to it, right? And that's all still in the realm of physicality, right? The physical existence and the science of the physical existence. But what physical... Uh, physicality and sight could never account for is the spiritual dimensions of a thing. It lacks, so when you look at something, you're lacking a more refined, abstract perspective and, and not even spiritual, even just, you know, poetic, right? What does it represent? What is it symbolic of, right? You look at, um, you can look at a cup of water and see a glass of water, or, or you can see life and write a whole poem about the existence of life, right? You can look at a rose, but then what does that represent? So anything abstract, refined, um, um, poetic is not, is not something you can see. Absolutely. We're also including uh, this idea of, of, um, spirituality, right? We know that the reason Hashem can't be seen is because he's not physical and anything physical is would any, any physicality limits something to that physicality. Whereas something spiritual is not limited by time, time and space and, 
and um, course, the coarseness that it shows up with in the world, but it goes way beyond that. Or even things like love, right? Love is abstract. It's not something you can see. So some things can't be seen at all, like God, or even in the, within the world, like love, emotions. You might see a person's facial expression that expresses their emotion, but you have to, you know, oh, that means that. You have to make that connection, right? Um, or I remember my mother once uh, told me that she listened to a whole sheer about an orange. So you can look at an orange and see it as an orange and you see just the orange. But if you listen to whole sheer about the orange, the wonders of an orange, then all of a sudden you appreciate its depth. But again, you have to listen to a sheer, a lesson about the beauty and the wonders and the incredible creation that is an orange in order to have this added appreciation of the orange. Otherwise, you're just looking at it and all you see is it's limited Corporeal, corporeal existence in the world. So this brings us to what happens um, on our by Harsinai. Oh, before we get to Harsinai, actually, in general, in the world, this is uh, what we're dealing with. This is how we. This is how we perceive the world. That physicality, gashmias, existence is all in the realm of sight, of seeing. And therefore to us, it, it's clear, it's concrete, it's tangible, it's perceptible, right? That's near a, uh, it's, it's possible to see it. And that feels very real to us. And a person doesn't need proofs for the existence of the physical world. It's like, I see it and therefore it is. <laughs> I think, I think I, it's a different quote I'm thinking of, but you know, I can see, and therefore it is. So it's uh, it's it's clear and and understood on its own, just from being physical and something that we can see. It's obvious or sense, right? With maybe we can touch, even if a person is blind, they can touch it and feel it, and it's something that they can experience with their with their senses in that way. On the other hand, in contrast to this, things that are ruchnias, things that are spiritual, are in the realm of nishma, in the realm of, of hearing, meaning that it is abstract and it demands proofs. Like my daughter wanting to know, like, how do you know, right? Like, okay, you're telling me this, right? But how, do, how am I supposed to believe that, right? I, I need you to prove it just because, right? Like in, in courts, very nice that that is what you're saying with your words, but I need proof. You need to get some tangible evidence, right? So in order to recognize ruchnius dimensions of the world or to appreciate something that is a spiritual reality, ruchnius is spiritual. Uh, I apologize if I, if I should have said that earlier. The spiritual dimensions of the world, it requires it requires time and effort to think about it, to learn about it, to meditate on it, right? To get ourselves, to train ourselves to think differently, to see beyond what you see, you know, to, to see things in a different way, um, to see beyond what is in front of us, when, in front of our eyes, to, to train ourselves to look at the world in a little bit of a deeper way, in a more refined, abstract, spiritual way. So it, that requires a lot of work. And even after all that, even after all that, it's still tangible, right? It's still, it's still this, um, it's still not tangible, I'm saying. Sorry, apologize. It's still not tangible the way that Gashmias is, that physicality is. So even after we put in all that learning and thought and meditation and trying to grasp, you know, some some spiritual concept, idea that, you know, I don't see, it's still not, it's not going to be experienced by me the same way that something physical in front of me is. It, re it remains abstract. Even after all that work, it remains abstract. So what happened by Harsinai? Here we are. What happened, the novelty that happened by Harsinai is... That, like we said, ro'in es hanishma, vishom'in es hanira. They saw that which is heard and they heard that which is seen. So the ruchnias, the spiritual 
the godliness, the abstract truth of God being the only true reality of the world, that truth, which is usually only something that we can learn about, talk about, hear about, and think about in an abstract way, all of a sudden that became clear, as clear as day, as we say, right? Concrete, so clear and obvious and concrete as if they're seeing it, they were seeing it. As we know, by Matan Torah, uh, by the giving of the Torah, Hashem revealed himself in such a clear, obvious way. It was such an enormous revelation of godliness by Har Sinai that it was just obvious. It was just clear to them. There is, in fact, this whole teaching that they didn't even have free choice at that point because, you know, being free choice, having free choice means it's not so obvious and I have to actually choose, right? And that's why, by the way, it's not usually the way the world is, is, is it's not so obvious and God is hidden. His reality is hidden. He made it that way on purpose so that we would have free choice. But in this unique experience of Matan Torah, he made himself so obvious to us that it was like, duh, they were going to accept the Torah. And that's why, by the way, as an aside, I just taught Megillah as Esther. So as an aside, by Purim, it says, Kimu v'kiblu hayehudim. They accepted upon themselves. What did they accept upon themselves? They accepted upon themselves Torah at a free choice. Because by Matan Torah, it was so clear, so obvious. So that, that like, of course, they were going to keep accept the Torah. So in a time of darkness by Megillus Esther, when there was persecution and things were not so hati tati, then, okay, if they're going to choose to keep the Torah, to be committed to the Torah, then, wow, that that's free choice. That's actually um, accepting the Torah for real. So that's just totally an aside, but that just also describes the level of clarity that they had by Matan Torah that they saw godliness. It wasn't abstract to them. It was concrete. It's like, you know, I've thought about before, what would I say if somebody were to ask me, so what, you know, why, how do you believe in the Torah? Why, what makes you believe in the Torah? What makes you believe that in God? What makes you a Torah observant Jew? Why are you religious at all? Like what religious I've been told is a dirty word, but why you were a, a Torah observant Jew? Um, Like, tell, tell me, explain to me, what is it that like, oh, now, you know, that you understand, right? I thought about so many times that I wouldn't be able to answer that in that kind of way. I wouldn't be able to tell them, well, it's this proof that makes me realize it's it's this that convinced me. It's because of this that I, I feel like it, you know, it, it makes sense to me. Uh -uh. Personally, it's just obvious. <laughs> it's just so obvious. It's so clear. It's as clear as day. It's there it, there can't be any other reality because, because this is the reality. I mean. It's just so clear and obvious to me, um, as real and obvious as one plus one is two. Of course, Hashem exists. And of course, he gave us the Torah. And, and of course, you know, it's all true. There's no, so anyway, that's Baruch Hashem. That is, um, and are you going to tell me now, wait, Becky, now you're telling me that you don't have free choice. <laughs> well, in some areas, maybe, but um. Hashem gives me opportunities in other areas, don't worry, um, to exercise my free choice. But the idea is, is that every Yid, by the way, has the ability to have this clarity because we all have an Ashama and an Ashama has five levels and the highest two levels, one of them, the highest level, the Yechida, is what is revealed on Yom Kippur. But the second to highest level, the Chaya, this Part of our neshama is the level of seeing. It sees the truth and sees elokus godliness as clear as they did by Matan Torah. It's so obvious to this aspect of our neshama, 
it, it, they see the truth. You, there's no, and that, by the way, is the level of our emuna. So where we get our emuna from is by tapping in to that part of our neshama that sees the truth. So clearly, you don't have to bring in proofs and you don't have to try and convince it. There's a part of every single Jew, no matter what they tell you, that that in their heart of hearts, they believe. Because a Jew has a has a, has a neshama and the neshama has this, it, it, the nesha, to the neshama, it's obvious. To the neshama, they, it sees. Now, happens to be this part of our neshama is a little bit abstract because it, it's a part of our neshama that surrounds us, <laughs> which is why we don't feel it so much. But that's our work. Our work is to bring it down into our, our um, body, into our life, into our experience, to draw from this part of us that, that sees the truth, that sees what's clear and obvious to it, and, and actually integrates it into our life into our perception into we, the way that we see things perceive things and look at the world okay so going back that they saw right this ruchnius this godliness okay on the other hand rabbi akiva taught that the the reverse was also true the gashmius the physicality of the world what's usually seen turned into something they only could like hear about. It actually, be, at the, the experience of Matan Torah, of the revelation of godliness at Matan Torah was so strong that physicality lost its veracity. It lost its, its validity. It, it didn't feel as concrete and real and tangible as, as it did before, a few minutes earlier. What felt real to them by Matan Torah, what felt, like I said before, right? What feels real to you? By Matan Torah, godliness is what felt real to them. More than the physical mountain that they were standing in front of. More than the lightning. So the lightning they only heard about. But the thunder, things that, you know, are more abstract and you hear, that was as obvious and clear as, as something I could see with my eyes. In line, aligned with that, um, as, oh no, I only have 10 minutes left. Okay, I should specifically not upgrade my Zoom so that I keep limited to this time frame. <laughs> I think it's a good time frame. Okay, so I want to I want to add to that, that remember how we said that spirituality is something that we usually question or things that are abstract is something that we can question and have have doubts about right because well i'm only hearing about it whereas seeing is believing so the sim similarly we're saying that the the physicality of the world lost its its hold on them to the point that that became like questionable now you might say what are you talking about they were still in the world how could the, the world the physicality of the world become questionable to them well let me tell you a story uh i Again, I apologize. I tried to to verify the details of the stories. I'm going to tell this and another one, um, but I'll do the best I can to because I I the way that I remember stories is the punchline. So the punchline is <laughs> that basically Hasidim people who study Hasidith and what is Hasidith? Hasidith is studying godliness. So the more you study Hasidus, the more you study godliness, and this is true to some extent of all of Torah, right? The more you study Torah, the more you see the world through the lens of Torah, through the lens, through a spiritual view, through a, a higher perspective, a perspective that gives you perspective on life. Um, so especially Hasidus, which talks about how enod milvado, there's nothing but God, and God is the only true existence, and everything is one with God. This is literally what it, what what it's, Volumes and volumes and volumes. So the more a person studies Hasidus, the more godliness becomes true to them and, and real to them. And they see it. We, we actually know the, a story of the Alter Rebbe that uh, he looked at a, a pole, like a, um, a pole of sorts. And he saw, like, I see the words of Hashem that are speaking it into existence right now. Like, that's what he saw because it was so obvious and real to him. So the story I was going to say is that some Hasidim, I believe, they said, okay, I know Enod Milvado. I know that there is nothing other than God. I know that God is the true existence, but how do I know that the world exists? Hmm. Now that's a good question, right? You know, I <laughs> I, um, I exist and therefore maybe I, <laughs> um, you know, I know that God exists. Who said I exist? 
And um, and people, I mean, philosophers have been asking this in, in so many forms and ways, right? But their answer is, well, the world must exist because it says in the Torah, Bereshus bara elokin, God created the world. <laughs> so if the Torah tells me that God created the world, then it must be that the world exists and I exist. Okay, great. But the reality of godliness being the true and only existence was so real to them and so true to them that they had to think about it for a minute. So I think that um, there's so much to discuss here. There is so much relevance. I know that even this will sound abstract, <laughs> but I really believe there is so much relevance. And with the time we have, I want to get to it. But first, let me answer that we asked why, um, how could there have been this miracle? And the answer is because it wasn't really a miracle. It wasn't that God created a, a, a miracle to make the them see the thunder, but rather it was an expression of, of the miracle of Matan Torah, the, the expression of the revelation of godliness that was Matan Torah. That is what Matan Torah was, the giving of the Torah on Har Sinai was this incredible revelation of godliness. So of course they were going to hear what was seen and seeing what is see what is what is usually heard like of course their entire perception is going to be inverted right that's the title of this class inverted perception their entire perception perception of the world was completely inverted and all of a sudden the physicality lost the 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 isness yes yes we say in because it is the 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 as we explained um until you know until it was just their their entire perception of the world was turned upside down. What was obvious to them was godliness. Now, Matan Torah was a one-time event. It didn't last because the world was not in a place where that kind of perception could last. However, in the future, when Mashiach comes, that will be the established state of the world, is to see the world with a with Ruchnius lens, with spiritual lens, from the lens of, you know, from God's perspective, how does he see things? But it's very important that we realize that we don't need to wait for Mashiach to come to begin to inculcate and integrate this kind of perspective into our life, into the way we see the world, right? So the question is, I think, what is your truth barometer? especially right with everything going on in the world, the craziness, the darkness, it feels so real to us, right? Because we're in this world and it feels very real to us. But what if we think about what is our truth barometer? Is our truth barometer what I see and even hear, like the news, like the, the, the pictures and the, am I going to take that as truth? The existence in front of me, the craziness, the darkness, is that my parameter for truth or is my truth anchored is something in something much deeper, much more eternal truth itself? How about, right? Why don't we anchor the way that we look at the world in truth itself? And we have access to that through learning Torah. The more we learn Torah, the more we get to see the world through a different lens, to experience things differently, to have a, a deeper perspective, right? So this, 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 to the point that and the, the goal is that we should get so used to seeing the world in this way that it becomes as obvious and clear to us as as you know, I'm trying to find two things in front of me. One plus one is two. It should become so obvious to us. So I want to um, add a story that I, I've been told by a few people that they think it's Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. Um, But again, the point is the point. The point is, is he said something along the lines of, oh, God, he was like complaining to God, like, ha, halavai, if only, if only, the physical pleasures of the world were in the books and Elokos godliness was apparent and available in front of us out in the open. But God, Hashem, you put the physical, true, you know, the physical reality, the physical um, pleasures of the world, you put the physical reality in front of us and you took Elokos godliness and you put it in the book. 
right? How, how, like, how far is that? He was always defending the Jewish people. And it's funny because I, I thought about this in my own life, like how many shelves and shelves of self-help books I have. And I just think to myself sometimes, goodness, if I only had the time to read all of them, my life would be so much better. What's the problem? I'm so busy living life that I don't have the time to read the books that will improve my life. So yes, first of all, I just want to acknowledge it's a catch-22. It's it's a challenge. It is. It is a challenge, right? But I think that it, what it needs to highlight to us is, yes, the importance of taking the time to gain perspective on life, whether that's reading a book or, you know, lear learning Torah. Yeah, learning something, learning, reading, listening to a shir, talking to a friend who has is wise, um, or all the other millions of ways um, that there are to if with effort and with um intention to gain perspective to help us see the world and see our lives and see our challenges through a deeper lens to to be able to look at something and see the truth of the situation right and parenting learning about the beauty of of each child and being able to um, inculcate that, that when you see a child, a child tantruming or bad behavior, that you should look at the truth of the situation and see they're really a soul in this world. They're really, you know, what's the truth of the moment? What is the truth of, of um, my child? What is the truth of my challenge? What is the truth of what's going on in Eretz Yisrael? What is the truth of the world? And the Torah tells us the truth of the world is that it's meant to be a garden. It's meant to be a beautiful place beautiful place. And if we're not seeing that, well, we need to align our perception to be able to start, A, looking at the world in this way, in a deeper way, in a, in a, in a, in a beautiful way, and, and not get stuck in this surface level perception. That is my, that is the takeaway for me of this class, to not get stuck seeing the world and living life with a surface level perception, but rather learning to see deeper. Have a beautiful Shabbos.